so uh, you're seeing I'm wearing a Harvard shirt. And you might have noticed I wasn't here in the month of June. That's because my work sent me to Boston for uh, training at Boston University. And one day I got on my bicycle, rented a bike, rode from BU across the bridge into Cambridge. There on the, uh, across the river uh, and onto the Boston, the uh, Harvard campus. And I went straight to the bookstore and I bought me a shirt that said Harvard because I can say in all truthfulness, I went to Harvard. So, you know, that's the way it is. Uh, um, it's kind of weird that this series has been called Old School. And, and Pastor Pancho asked me to back clean up on the series. I'd like to also give some, some props uh, to Pastors Pancho and Laura. Um, we too, when we came to Austin, gave up everything we had, all of our security job that I held for 19 years, running a staff of 300 people, church of 15,000. And we came to Austin because God said go. And it was really like jumping off a bridge and hoping that you had a bungee cord attached. And when I met these two, it was like God said, this is you. These people have the same heart that you had when you came to this city. And these are the people you need to pass the torch to. And so I would like to honor our pastors because every day from then till now, they've demonstrated that stamina and courage. Amen. It's always fun when you get to embarrass your pastor in front of everybody. So, so um, this has been titled Old School. And I've got a picture here that shows you that I can speak to being old school. This is me, the little red circle, literally in an old school. That was me in the second grade. That's as far as I went with my education. I've, uh, come, um, but but that, that is the proof that I'm qualified to speak about being old school. Now, what some of you may not realize is when I first accepted Jesus, I was in the new school. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't old school back then. And I would look at the guys that look like me now and say, why don't you guys just die and move on? Because we're ready to take over. So I get it. <laughs> when we talk about the definitions of the terms, old school and new school. I looked up the term old school and it said anything from an earlier era that is looked upon with high regard and respect. It also said someone or something that is old fashioned or traditional. That's a shoe that kind of fits me. And then actually this term was coined back in the 19th century to mean anything that was considered out of date with current trends and social settings. And I would say that for many people, when you say old school, that's kind of the way they look at it. Like you're out of step. You're, you're past your shelf date. New school, on the other hand, is a way of thinking that's typical of the current era that we live in. And you and I are pretty much socialized to believe that what is new is better. Amen? If it's new, it's better. Now, look, I can't remember who's, who talked about the, the expiration date on food in their pantry. Was it, was it you? You talked about that? That I am the guy who completely ignores those. I mean, they're just suggestions anyway. So, so if you come to my house, I may open a can of tuna that said, best if used by 1975. But I figure if there's not a bulge in the can, it's still good, right? But we're just kind of shaped, we're trained to believe that what's new is better than what's old. Now, if 
what we've been studying in the book of James, we're calling old school. So if James, and you want to put his picture up there, if James represents the old school, hiya, James. Oh, no, that's not it. There you go. If James represents the old school, I tried to find a picture that represents a new school. Now, I'm not picking on them, but if you think about the culture that we operate in, those values are being spoken to us all the time. That this is the way to think, this is the way to, to believe. This is, And I'm not saying everything that's old school is good or everything that's new school is bad or vice versa. In fact, I would like to kind of lift the conversation and say, yeah, there's old school, some of which needs to be changed. And yeah, there's new school, some of which needs to be critically examined. But there's a school that transcends the old and the new, that actually has endured for millennia. And the values of that school are not changing. The principles of that school don't move with the cultural winds. They're anchored because they're anchored and founded in the Word of God. And that's what James is talking about. We don't want to throw out the old in order to embrace something that's less than life-sustaining. In his letter, James speaks to Christians of the first century about how to live out the Christian life. Now, the challenge for preaching anytime, and by the way, I'm not going to preach today, I'm going to preach. Right? That's where you do as much teaching as you do preaching, Okay? So we're going to take this apart a little bit, this chapter 5. James is speaking to people who were raised in a completely different milieu, in a totally different culture and environment. They were raised in Judaism. They were born, drilled into them from day one, that all of their life they have these philosophies in their head. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes along. And the resurrected Jesus Christ turned their religion on its head. So these are Jews who are trying to figure out what it means to be Jewish in your culture and your tradition while embracing the fact that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins and rose again for your justification. And James is saying, okay, I'm going to tell you how to live. And these things that he says to us in chapter 5 are ways to live out the Christian life. And this is how I would say that this is the transition. This is the, the transcendent school because these principles are no different for us today than they were for the Christians 2,000 years ago. Now, can I tell you, in all honesty, the book of James has been controversial for a long time. Martin Luther called it the epistle of straw. And that's because when he read it, he thought James's emphasis on works was contrary to the way he read the Pauline letters where it says faith alone is the source of your salvation. In his words in Latin, sola fide. But all apologies to Martin Luther, he had it wrong. Because if you look carefully at what James said, he's not writing about works apart from faith. He's saying that faith is manifested by works. In chapter 2, he told us faith without works is dead. In other words, if we're not living out this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, it does us really no good to come and act like we have a faith that we don't really possess. See, I'm wearing a shirt that says Harvard, but I can barely spell Harvard. I didn't get a Harvard education. In fact, my wife and I were at, stayed a few extra days in Boston after the training was over, and I can't remember, we were downtown, we were walking the Liberty Trail, and as we walked into this restaurant, a guy was walking out, and he saw my shirt, I was wearing the Harvard shirt. Yeah, you're kind of bold to wear a Harvard shirt in Boston. So I'm wearing my Harvard shirt, and he says, class of 71. I went, UTSA. <laughs> I didn't go there, I just bought the shirt. Well, there's a lot of people walking around in this world who don't really have a life-changing faith in Jesus Christ. They just wear the shirt. They're, they're just, they're, they're, they're in 
the, they're in the fellowship. Like we had a guy one time, and we were filming in Israel, and we got this guy, and we, and we found out he, he said he was a Christian. So we asked him, tell us about your, your testimony of becoming a Christian. And it was hard because there was a language barrier. But it took us about five times, and we'd, we'd say, tell us how you became a Christian. And he would say, what do you mean? I'm a Christian. No, no, tell us how you became a Christian. I'm Christian. Wait, wait. Tell us how you became a Christian. He said, look, my grandfather was a Christian. My father was a Christian. What choice did I have? I'm a Christian. That's somebody that's wearing the shirt, but not walking the walk. So James is going to tell us not how to wear the shirt. James is going to tell us how to walk the walk. And in doing that in the, in the fifth chapter, as he's bringing this letter to a close, and like any good biblical letter writer, he's going to sum up in the last chapter of his writing everything that he's been saying through the first chapters. So that's a hint, right? If you want to really do some good New Testament study, read the first chapter. It tells you what it's going to be about. Read the last chapter. It tells you what it was about. And then everything in between is filling in the blanks. And as he's closing out his letter, these are some of his last words. He says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and the spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. James is now going to close out his letter by telling us how to live in the light of all the things that he has said. And here's what he gives us basically four B's. And I even put some B's to kind of sting it into your memory. (laughs) Think about it. Okay. Be prepared. Be patient. Be persevering. And be prayerful. Be prepared. Be patient be persevering, and be prayerful. Now, all of those things are built upon a platform of the expectation that the Lord's coming will be soon. And I don't know if you've read the scripture and you see how many times these guys will refer to the Lord's coming as imminent. Like I said, I'm old school. When I became a Christian in the mid-1970s, I'd say 19 because if I say 70s, some of you would think 1870s. So in the mid-70s, when I became a Christian, we were very, 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 very much focused on the end of the world and the coming of the Lord. If you listen, we read Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth. If you listen to the music that came out of that era, we'd sing choruses like, He's coming soon, or the King is coming. You could hear sermon after sermon after sermon that the Lord is coming very soon. I even had friends who refused to get a higher education or have children because they were sure Jesus was going to come and they didn't want to basically mess things up. Like he didn't have room for another kid in heaven or something. Now, were we wrong? Were these first century Christians wrong when they said the Lord's coming is imminent? Well, let me give you a little insight before we jump off into the four B's. When we talk about the coming of the Lord, there's two senses in which we can talk about that. The first was the most obvious one, and that's to talk about the the coming of the Lord when he returns and all the things we read in the prophets and the book of Revelation are fulfilled. That will happen. Jesus Christ will physically come again to the earth and fulfill every promise that was made in the scripture. That's going to happen. When will it happen? I have no idea. I believe if I figured it out, God would change the date. Just because Jesus said, no one knows, right? So he said, oh, that guy figured it out. We're moving it, God. Make it Tuesday. So there's, that's one way of looking at the coming of the Lord. But there's another way. And that's less of a global coming and more of an individual coming. And listen to this old school guy. Every one of us was born with an expiration date, like that tuna fish on my shelf. It may come at the end of seven, eight, nine, ten decades, I hope, for you. And it may come at the end of one or two or three. None of us has a guarantee that we have tomorrow. Amen? I mean, I'm not trying to depress you, but we need to get real. None of us knows 
how long we're going to last. The Bible says in Psalm 139, every day was written in his book before one of them came into existence. So we know God knows the days, but we don't know what the day is. So in that sense, the Lord's coming is imminent. And to that degree, what James is saying, you need to live every day like the Lord could come today because you don't know. You don't know. You can't stop in mid-process of dying and say, give me a do-over, God. Or, hey, I want to go back and obey. I want to go back and fulfill that stuff that those crazy people were talking about when they were reading those five chapters of James. It doesn't work that way. Death is like a thief. It comes suddenly. Listen, in my business, I see it all the time. As a chaplain with, working with police, I see the tragedy that happens in homes all across Austin every single day. And how many of those, the people say, if I only had one more minute with him or one more hour, just a little bit more time, it happens. So the sense of urgency that we need to have about these four Bs is based on the platform that the Lord's coming for each of us is imminent. We have no idea exactly when it will happen, but we know it will. And I don't know about you, but the words I want to hear when I breathe my last breath on this planet is this beautiful, resonant voice that says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into the joys of your master. Now, all right, so be prepared, be patient, be persevering, and be prayerful. Let's talk about the first one, be prepared. James starts chapter 5 with a word of admonition. Listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. Now, we hear that, we read that, and we think, yeah, God, go get those rich people. They suck. <laughs> right? Beat them up, God. But do you know that you are rich? Let me just talk about it from a practical point of view. America is among the 10 wealthiest nations in the world. Years ago, I went on a mission trip to Haiti. It was a medical mission trip. We cleaned wounds. We gave worming medicine. We even pulled teeth to help people have a better quality of life. And we had been given, there was a dentist on the trip with us, and he brought a thousand toothbrushes. And we went into City Soleil. In case you don't know, Haiti is the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. So we took our thousand toothbrushes and we went to City Soleil, which is the largest slum in the Western Hemisphere. It's one square mile and it has over a million people living in it. In one square mile. We started giving away toothbrushes and started a riot as people literally fought over a stinking free toothbrush. My friend, that's poverty. How does the Bible define wealth? John the Baptist said, if you have two coats and you see a person with none, give your extra coat. In other words, the biblical definition of wealth is to have all that you need and then a little bit. So if you've got two cans of tuna fish, congratulations, you're wealthy. If you, how many people in this room have two coats? Come on, be honest. I got like eight. How many, how many people have a, an, have a loaf of bread at home that has two or more slices in it? Give us this day our daily bread, and you got a week's worth. See, in the eyes of God, we are wealthy. So when he says be prepared, one of the things he means is be prepared for the coming of the Lord by using your resources today in a way that honors God. In other words, the time, the talents, the treasures that you have, use those in a way that communicates God's blessing and love and grace to the people around you. You say, well, I'll do that when I you know, get success in my career when I got a nice car, nice house, nice spouse, fill in the blanks. The Lord's coming is near. How do you know you are going to have career success or a nice house and nice car? Take today to use that resource in a way that honors God. Your time, your talents, your treasure. That's what we mean by being prepared. 
So everything that you have in your life, how many of you are married? Raise your hand, Mary. How many of you are sitting close to your spouse? All right. If you're sitting close to your spouse, I want you to turn and look at him for a second. It's okay. We're not going to get a fight or anything like that. I want you to look at him and say, thank you for the gift that you are to me. Thank you for the gift you are to me. See, everything in our life, every blessing we have is a gift from God. The fact that you have health is a gift from God. The fact that you have a family, people that love you, is a gift from God. The fact that you have shelter over your head is a gift from God. The fact that you actually have leisure time to be able to go and do something other than just make a living. See, I know people in living on the border who live in colonias who literally have to work two or three jobs just to make 30 or $40 a month. And they don't have the leisure time to give to their church. But you do. I want everybody to say, I'm rich. Come on, you start thinking that way. I'm rich. Another way to say it is, I'm blessed. And if you're blessed, then you want to be a blessing. And that's what being prepared is all about. It's by it's saying, okay, God, I don't have to, I'm not going to wait 10 years, 20 years, 30 years before I start kicking it into gear and serving you. I'm going to serve you now. I'm going to take these gifts, these times, talents, and treasure. I'm going to use them now. See, we are to prepare for the coming of the Lord by using our resources wisely while we wait here on earth. So we are to be prepared, he says, so that we're not surprised when that day of judgment com- comes. Somebody, I have probably multiple times, for sure, multiple times in my life, I have been asked, why are you doing all the stuff that you're doing? Sometimes my wife even says that. Why are you getting into everything you get into? And I'm not even going to list all the stuff. that Because whenever I see a door that I think God has opened, I walk through it. And I am fully prepared when I get to heaven for God to say, I didn't open that door. You knocked it down. But what I don't want to do is get to heaven and hear God say, I opened the door and you didn't go through it. You stood on the other side and looked at or waited for somebody else. I want to use the resources I have now. I'm not going to rust out. I'm going to burn out. You get what I'm saying? Principle number one, be prepared. Be prepared by using your resources today in a way that glorifies God so that when you appear before him, you won't be ashamed. We're all going to stand before the judge, every one of us, to give an account for what we did with what he gave us. I'm going to account for what I did to, to bless and love my wife because that's a, she's a gift God gave me, and how I treat her is my way of saying to God, I appreciate this gift. Are you with me? Number two, be patient. Everybody say patient. Okay, I could stop right here. This is the point where the treacher gets convicted. How many of you have a problem with patience? Come on, be honest. How many of you know somebody has a problem with patience? (laughs) Why are we to be patient? The Bible has a lot to say about being patient. I like One of my favorites is what Paul said to the Colossians in in Colossians chapter 1 in his prayer. He said, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Now, then he modifies it and tells us how we please him. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so you may have great endurance and patience. And joyfully giving thanks to the Father has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom. So we are to be patient as we await the Lord's return. Now, what does that look like? Well, first, we need to learn to be patient in the process. How many of you have ever asked God for something in prayer and gotten ticked off at his timetable? Yeah? It's like, come on, God. I asked for that yesterday. What's the holdup? It says, ask and you shall receive. Where is it? I want what I want when I want it. We confuse God with McDonald's. Put the order in the window, drive up, your meal will be waiting for you with a smile. Let me give you a clue. 
And this is coming from somebody in the old school. By the way, in case you're wondering, I, I, this year I'll be 68 years old. So I think I got the time and grade to be able to talk about old school stuff. So here you go. God cares more about the process than he does about the product. See, you prayed for God to do something or give you something or show up in some way. And what God wants to do is develop you through the process. And a lot of times what that means is I'm going to go through some pain. Look, there are people who can relate to this. You wanted to have a child. What did God do? He put you through nine months of pregnancy and ever how long the labor was. You appreciated it when it was over. And God developed you in many ways. There were lessons you learned through that process that you would have never learned. You couldn't have read them in a book. Am I talking right? Some of you prayed about a mate and God took his sweet time about bringing that person into your life. You know why? Because you weren't ready. If he'd have given you what you were asking for, when you were asking for it, you would have blown it up. You would have destroyed it. Because there's uh, what God, God, we look at it from the product point of view. God looks at it from the process point of view. In him, the product is not you having another car or a nice house or a better job or a spouse or a child or whatever it is you're asking for. With him, it's I want to develop my character in you. I want you to look like me. And so whatever it takes to get you there, God's going to do it because he loves you too much. See, Jesus said, we, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right? That's, that's, what, that's what we read in the letters, in Paul's letter. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to see him as he is, so I want to be like him. So God, anything in me that doesn't look like you, knock it off. We grow impatient with the process, but God is more interested in developing our character than he is in giving us what we want. Secondly, being patient means being patient with the people. Listen, God is a genius, and he completely screws up our life by bringing a bunch of people into it. was a usher that was going through the church one Sunday afterwards and he found a note on a seat he opened it up and a guy had in the church had written a poem and it said to dwell above with saints I love oh that will be glory to dwell below with those I know that's another story My life would be perfect if it weren't for the people in it. So what happens? You got a problem with your anger. You got a short fuse. And what does God do? He puts people in your life that tick you off. Why is that? Because the only laboratory where you can walk out the character, the patient love of Jesus Christ is if you're confronted with stuff that aggravates that anger. Right? I'm impatient. I don't want to wait. God will put people in your life that test your last nerve. Why? Because he wants to develop that trait in you. Be patient means not only being patient with the process that God has you in, it means being patient with the people around you that are part of that process. Folks, I can tell you I've learned really more from people that I'm in, that I was deeply opposed to philosophically or whatever, than I ever learned from people who thought the same way I did. As iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens another. How many of you right now, if I stop, God's already put in your heart somebody you need to be working on being patient with? Yeah. Pay attention to that because, you know, there's a deal I should have told you up front is that when the pastor gets an assignment and I got the assignment from the pastor that I was going to preach on chapter five, my responsibility, the responsibility immediately comes on me that I have to go and hear from God and I have to digest what the spirit is saying. And then I have to give it back to you in an unadulterated version. 
when you hear it, the responsibility falls on you. You're not responsible for a word you haven't heard, but once you've heard the word, congratulations, you own it. So God says, be patient with the process and be patient with the people that I put in your life. That's why over and over again, even when James is saying some pretty harsh stuff, he keeps reminding us, brothers, brothers, brothers. In other words, your family. How many of you have family members you don't like? Come on. Some, I saw a little coffee mug that said, friends are the family you picked for yourselves. So... We all have family. I mean, you, you, you got it by virtue of birth or marriage or whatever, and you're stuck with that brother-in-law. You know, you're stuck with those people you don't like. No, you're not stuck with them. God knew they were going to come into your life, and you should ask yourself, if this person rubs me the wrong way, what is there that God wants to develop in me? Be patient. Be prepared. Be patient. And the third B is be persevering. Now, this is connected with being patient, but while being patient has to do with waiting on the process, persevering has to do with the pain that comes often with the process. If you get nothing else today, I hope you get this. Christianity is hard. If you wanted the easy road, this ain't it. Christianity comes with hardships. Number one hardship is the minute that you embrace Jesus, you got an enemy who wants to take you out. The number two hardship is you live in a world that you are no longer made for. You're a citizen of eternity having to walk in the here and the now. Life is hard. Every every dream doesn't come true. In fact, we talk a lot in this church about broken dreamers. It hurts when your dreams are dashed. You know, we are parents who have put one of our children into a coffin into the ground. That wasn't ever my action plan for life. There are disappointments that come with this life. There are hardship. There are days when you can look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm just going to give up on this. You know, I'm just, it was, it was more fun when I was getting drunk than living like this. And to that, James says, be persevering. When the hardship comes, don't give up. When the pain comes, don't give up. When the difficulties are there, don't give up. He who endures to the end shall be saved. God is causing all things to work together for your good and his glory, whether you know it or not. And I can tell you that the darkest moments of my life, in retrospect, I can look at them now and say, Look how God took that, which at the time was like having a root canal, and God turned it around and used it ultimately in a beneficial way in my life, but more importantly, to let his glory shine in a way that I could have never imagined would happen. Be persevering. He gives the image of a farmer. I don't know if any of you have ever worked agriculture, but that farmer has to work hard. He has to get out there and prepare the soil. He has to plow it. He has to remove all the rocks and the the trees and the brush. And then he has to plant the seed. And then he has to water it. And then he has to fertilize it. And he has to keep the wild animals or birds or whatever from picking those seeds out. And he has to just wait and hope there's going to be a crop. And if there's a drought, he still has to hope. And if there's a flood, he still has to hope. Because he can't do anything about the harvest. He knows, as a farmer, it's hardship on the way to harvest. As a believer, what we need to understand is, as Christians, it's hardship on the way to harvest. This momentary light affliction is producing the weight of his glory. Now, you know, that doesn't doesn't get preached very much. People want to hear, life is a fairy tale. We all live happily ever after. Bad things don't happen to good people. Rooster pucky. Bad things happen to good people all the time. But God takes that and turns it around for their good. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will bring it to pass. Well, I've never been in a situation where I had to trust that it didn't involve waiting. And waiting itself can be painful. 
You don't believe me? Next time you go to H-E-B, get in the longest line you can find. <laughs> like Paul, James knew that hardship was normal and necessary to a Christian. And just this little last word before I move on to our final B. That according to James, persevering means no complaining. Ooh, ouch. Turn to the person next to you and say, you need to quit griping. <laughs> Folks, some of us are constantly calling the wambulance. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's no grumbling. You want an example of perseverance, look to the book of Job. A man who one day is standing in a field and servant after servant after servant comes up and says, hey, this disaster happened, this disaster happened, this disaster happened, this disaster happened. He loses all his wealth. And then the last servant comes up and says, by the way, your 10 kids are all dead. Now that's pain. That's broken dreams. That's heartache. That's hardship. And what does the Bible say was his response? In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He didn't talk back to God. He didn't say, God, what's wrong with you? Did he cry out to God in his pain? Yes. Did he tell God, God, I wish I'd never been born, that I wouldn't have to endure this? Yes. Did he say to God, this is wrong? This is not fair. No. No. He said, shall I accept good from the Lord and not accept bad? You see, he had a secret. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will see him. God calls us to be persevering through the pain because the reward will be when he takes your face in his hands and he dries the tears from your eyes and he embraces you in his arms and says, come here. I saw every tear. I knew every heartache. I felt every pain and I prepared a place for you. James's last words. And this is the umbrella he puts over everything. He says, be prayerful. How can I persevere? How can I be patient? How can I be prepared? By praying. You see, prayer changes the way I think. Prayer changes my heart. Prayer brings the presence of God. Prayer brings eternity into the here and the now. It's how the kingdom of God comes to be expressed in the world in which we live. When we pray. James said, remember Elijah. He was a human being just like us. But he prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain for three years. Why? Because the prayers of a righteous person, a person in relationship with Jesus, are powerful and effective. Over all things, be prayerful. Now I want to wrap it up with this thought. These are not the five, the four do's. These are not things that you're given to go out and do. These are four bees. They are words of character. They are words, this ha, these are attitudes that have to be cultivated in relationship with God. Are you going to instantly right now be patient? Are you going to instantly right now be persevering? Are you going to instantly right now take all your time and talents and treasures? And just, no, probably not. But as you pray and seek the face of God and ask him to develop these things in you, suddenly you'll find yourself responding in patience, in perseverance, in prayer. And when that happens, you'll know, like James, you're ready for the judge to come. You're ready for the coming of the Lord. We are dreamers. And each of us probably has our own understanding of what that means. We have our own individual dreams, but the big dream that God has given all of us is let his kingdom come and let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Could you stand with me?
Would you just lift your hands to heaven? Those hands, both hands lifted up to the sky is a universal sign of surrender. So if nothing else, if we just are willing to give up and say, Lord, I want you. And whatever in me that needs to be changed so that I can have all of you taking over all of me, I surrender. Father, I pray you can see from heaven the hands that are lifted up. More importantly, you can see from heaven the condition of the hearts that are lifting the hands. And I ask God, I pray, that you would receive this as an offering, that we as a congregation are saying, here we are, God. If, if no one else on planet Earth is serious, we're getting serious with you right now. Lord, we want to be prepared for your coming. We want to be patient through the process as you develop us. We want to be persevering through hardship and pain and sorrow and suffering. And most importantly, God, we want to be people of prayer who invoke your power and your presence on the planet Earth. So God, hear our prayer, hear our cry, and pour out your presence, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 